This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Well, welcome to the University of London. It's always for me a particular pleasure, having been Vice-Chancellor here for seven years, to be back. And it's also very pleasant because, in a funny way, the activities of the University of London and the success of the Visiting Professorship Scheme are intimately intertwined because of the existence of the School of Advanced Study, very, very distinguished body, as many of you will know, which very kindly always hosts. And you'll hear a little bit more from the director um, later, who is with us. I was joking with Anne. I recognize quite a number of the faces. And I said, you obviously have your own groupies now, who some I know have been to all the lectures, some have been to more, certainly more than one. I have been chairman of the New Zealand UK Link Foundation now for three years. And this scheme was a very important part of the whole process of repositioning the foundation to give it a real bit of academic weight. And as I've said on other occasions, the driving force when we come to assess the applications for the visiting professorship is whether or not we think not only is the content timely and scholarly, but also that it will leave legacy, that part of the outcome, one of the outcomes of the whole process of having the visiting professor is that there will be connections made new, there will be connections made old, revigorated, and generally um, important. And there's no doubt that Anne has fulfilled every possible aspiration we have had for growing legacy, not only through her work with the Parliament of Westminster and the Assembly in Wales, but also with the very important organisations that so many of you come from. Um, so could I take this opportunity and to thank you personally for the way in which you've given so unsparingly of your time and your intelligence and your commitment and your enthusiasm in interacting with the community. It is everything we had hoped for. This evening we have the fourth lecture in the series. As you can see, research relevant to the well-being and rights of children, issues which are critically um, important. But, as ever, this is about the time that I begin to feel the ground moving under my feet and I need a professional. And this evening I have a professional, um, Dr. Virginia Morrow from Oxford, and it is my pleasure, Virginia, to hand over the proceedings to you. But, just before you speak, I am required um, to give you the one bit of housekeeping advice you need. In the event that the Senate House suddenly catches fire, you have to exit down the stairway, which is you through the door, turn left, and you'll see a stairway. That is your escape route. We've done very well over the years without a fire. I don't suddenly expect one this evening. Thank you. Virginia. Okay, I will be brief. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. I was at the Institute of Education for seven years where I ran the MA in Sociology of Childhood and Children's Rights, plug. and it's lovely to see some of my former colleagues here today. So I'm a bit disappointed though, because last time I came here there was a film being made, and this place was a whole film set. It was great fun. But anyway, um, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Anne Smith to you tonight. Um, as many of you will know, She's been involved in research, advocacy, and policy making on childhood matters in New Zealand for about almost 40 years. Um, she's worked as an academic at the University of Otago, first in the education department, later as, a, as director of the Children's Issues Centre, which many of us from around the world sort of hold up as a, well, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have one of those? She's been called on for advice by various government departments and ministries in her career. She's had personal contact with ministers, government officials, and has taught and collaborated on research with many colleagues. She's also participated in a very wide range of advisory groups, working parties, and committees. 
and her career has been devoted to making New Zealand a better place for families and for their children, for advocating children's well-being rights in early, and rights in early childhood education, the family, schools, and in social welfare and legal systems. And I came to the lecture that she gave a couple of weeks ago about how research has linked with pol adv advocacy and policy change in relation to the corporal punishment of children um, in New Zealand. And it was very useful for me personally because and indeed the question that she's addressing tonight, both of those topics really are central to the work that I'm currently involved in myself at the University of Oxford um, in Young Lives, which is a study that is following um, a longitudinal study of children growing up in poverty in Ethiopia, Andhra Pradesh in India, Peru and Vietnam, where we grapple constantly at various levels, national and international, with the question of how you translate or you make research relevant and useful for policy and, um, and indeed for practice in relation to the well-being and the rights of children. So Anne, please proceed and we're looking forward to hearing your talk. I'm going to sit down there but I'll come back to handle the questions after Nigel's done his commentary. Thank you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, I have to start with a few thanks. I know this is usually at the end, but I probably won't have the opportunity then. So again, I'd like to thank the New Zealand Link Foundation and Sir Graham Davis, but particularly Lisa Fletcher, who's just done this amazing job of networking with anyone that might possibly be interested in my topics. And this, uh, many of you will have had contact with her. I'd like to thank the School of Advanced Studies for hosting me and for Philip Murphy at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. And I'd like to thank Sir Lockwood Smith, who apparently is hosting the after uh, the refreshments afterwards, which hopefully will be good New Zealand wine. <laughs> so the, in this last lecture, and I must say I'm looking forward to not having any more to prepare, but a bit sad to at, um, having to leave London which will happen next week. So I've repeatedly started with this presentation of the theme which has run through my various lectures. First of all, the moral imperative of children's rights to make a difference to children's lives. So I guess I'm saying that one enters research not from a value-free basis, but with a particular moral imperative. And the role of research and researchers, together with others, uh, the role they play in promoting reforms to enhance children's rights. And in relation to the role of children's rights in childhood studies in this, what should be studied? How should it be studied? And how should it be reported and disseminated is really what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. And finally, the last question that Jenny raised, how can we optimise the uptake of research? So I just wanted to say a little bit about my own, the way I came into this field. Uh, having worked originally as a pretty tireless advocate in the early childhood field within an education department at the University of Otago, I moved to the position of director of the Children's Issues Centre. And when I was in, uh, took up that position, I was lucky enough to be invited to a, a meeting in South Carolina of Child Watch International Research Network. And I, I had to remind myself of this because it really did have a very strong impact on me. But this is a global network of research institutes like the Children's Issues Centre working around the world on issues related to children's rights. And their purpose is to collaborate in child research for the purpose of promoting child rights and improving children's well-being around the world. So it was a fantastic opportunity to meet with other researchers who had similar vision, really, of what they wanted to do um, with research. And it gave us a place in that global community of researchers. <coughs> 
And so uh, these were the sorts, one of the main streams of the, behind <coughs> my uh, work at the Children's Issue Centre where I was for 12 years and worked with an interdisciplinary group of people and looking at the current conditions of childhood and as they say, finding a vision. So that was something of a personal impetus, but then the impact of children's rights theory and childhood studies theory came to be very important for us. And I've used this quote from Elena Alanen from Finland, and she talks about childhood studies as being a discipline which is a critique of the way children's lives are organized and regulated and childhood undervalued in modern societies and underpinned by a sense of social justice and what makes a difference in children's lives. It, it's concerned to treat children as agents and social actors, which hopefully reduces the chance of them being exploited and the neglect of ch concerns that they have. And monitoring the implementation of children's rights. And actually, I've just, Ginny Mora just gave me an interesting article on this and there are a lot of problems with monitoring the implementation of children's rights, which I'll perhaps mention briefly again later. That one is a problematic goal. It's very hard to compare people from all around the world on a set of indicators. So um, here's a quote from Martin Woodhead. Research is a cultural practice marked by specific patterns of adult-child relationships through which children's nature is constructed as much as it is revealed. Now, um, I think what that is telling us is that we come to research with particular constructions of childhood. And in my lecture on physical punishment, for instance, I've talked about quite a large body of research that shows that physical punishment has long-term negative impact on children. And I drew on that research which is mainly out from the field of psychology. Um, but the assumptions behind doing that research are really that children are there to be uh, shaped, controlled, made to behave the way that adults want them to behave. So that's what I mean by saying that researchers come to their research with a different kind of um, construction of childhood. Mm -hmm. In contrast, I'd say, in my first lecture I talked about uh, the early childhood curriculum in New Zealand. Much of the research there is very different. It looks actually at, ch at children's competence and sees them as confident learners and social actors. It looks on them as both beings and becomings. Because that's the other problem. M much of the research in the field of childhood is about what's going to make a good life for children or good, I suppose, fodder for the economy uh, by what we do to children. <coughs> and uh, I think while that is important, and I don't deny that it, it shapes it, a lot of our research, it's also to look, important to look at children as beings. For instance, to give an example, um, being bullied at school might have long-term negative in implications, but it also makes a life of suffering now. Um, not having recreational opportunities is another example of where um, the, the being, the, the in the moment experience of children is also important. So that I, I suggest that we should be thinking as well as children as beings. The other thing that shapes what we do research on is um, what we think children should be doing. And of course, um, that excludes many fields of childhood and it's wonderful to see the Young Lives Project which is looking at children in different parts of the world and in the majority world where they are doing lots of things besides going to school and being in their families. Um, and Woodhead has pointed out that we neglect a lot of the issues back around childhood that affect people in, or young people in most of the world. Even in New Zealand, um, paid work is commonplace for children. The, the majority, the primaries, I think that might be a bit different from England, but I'm not sure. Um, it, it's very common for children to have part-time jobs after school and so on. And one of my colleagues 
has done a study on that, but it wasn't something that was studied at all. There are problems with approaching some topics in research. Now, um, I've talked about the lack of shared meaning between children and adults, um, and I've got a couple of examples to illustrate that. Actually, again, drawing on um, something that Martin Woodhead and Dorothy Faulkner wrote. He wrote about how when he was a young researcher, he was doing some research in um, primary schools. And uh, he had to psychologically test four-year-old four nursery school children to measure the impact of cognitive style on their learning. And uh, he was troubled by the fact that children didn't seem very keen to be involved in this task with him, and some actually refused to participate when he introduced them to the task in a small room away from the main play area. The head teacher then told him later that this room was known as the naughty room, and that their reluctance was nothing to do with him or the task. And a very similar experience happened to me when I was doing some observational work of children in the playground, in a, in a primary school playground, where um, I was just sitting there watching particular children. And uh, I noticed the children were looking at me very strangely. And uh, eventually, one uh, brave child came up to me and said, you realize that's the naughty seed. It was just outside the office, and this is exactly the same sort of thing. So there is often imbued meaning that is imbued in context for children that adults don't necessarily understand unless they've really been around children for long enough. There were some areas where, in the course of my lectures, I've identified what I think is a research vacuum. And certainly, perhaps not so much in the UK, but in New Zealand, child protection would be one of them. There is almost no longitudinal research on things like the impact of family group conferencing, the impact of different kind of policies and practices on children. One of the reasons for that is because children are constructed as vulnerable to harm, and particularly children in the child protection system are trebly so. Um, in, even talking to children in our child protection system was almost impossible in New Zealand. It was controlled by an ethics committee run by a government department called Child, Youth and Family, um, which um, often didn't reply to your applications for about six months, but then they would very often not give permission. Even having gained permission from that committee, you would have to get the permission of the birth parents, um, the foster carers and the children themselves. Often the children were keen to participate, but one didn't have um, approval from the others. So there were many gatekeepers protecting <coughs> children, particularly children described as, sense, uh, as vulnerable. And another reason why we avoid certain topics is that adults don't think it's necessary to talk to children because they are certain that they themselves know what is in children's best interest. And many times, of course, they do. For parents are probably the closest to what happens to children, and very often they can give a very good picture of what children are thinking. But sometimes they get it wrong, too. And the other one, which I think is a big one, too, and I think also influences that issue about not being able to do research in child protection is the worries about what children might say about the professionals that they are working with, about their teachers, about their carers, and even about their families. So, so that really was a little discussion about what we should be looking at. I, I, don't, I haven't said what what topics we should look at, but I am saying that it is not neutral what we can study, that are, there are in fact many areas that are very difficult for us to research. So what kind of approach should we be taking to research? And you're probably going to dismiss me as a, a hopeless eclectic because I have come to that position. I have other colleagues who will only take a postmodernist point of view or a quantitative point of view or some uh, philosophical position, but I actually think 
that different questions demand different research approaches and that all of them are part of childhood studies. Um, in terms of children's role in research, there are many possible roles for children. They can be advisors to a research team, they can be co-researchers, they can be the initiators of research themselves, and there's been some really interesting work in that. They can be informants, and they can be respondents, and then that is the, the last category is the most common, really. And that research is important too. But, and I'd just like to acknowledge here that although I'm very interested in children's perspectives, it's not sensible to think that all research has to position children as the main informants. But I still think there's a lot to be said for remembering that they must not be invisible. Um, one of my doctoral students, who's now a postdoctoral fellow, Marianne Powell, for her master's uh, study, we talked to researchers and about how they did their research ethically. And one of the things that was really interesting was, and I have to say it was psychologists, they really hadn't thought of asking for children's consent at all. They knew that you had to get <coughs> parents' consent. And it, it's quite common to talk about children's assent, you know, that you know, really it's the parents that consent and children just assent. I'm not quite sure what it means, but in that I do think makes them invisible. So children are, should be, I, th I believe, uh, constructed as participants in the research, helping researchers advocate for improvements to policy. Now this brings the other strand of research that I'm interested in, um, sociocultural theory to play, and this says that children uh, not alone, that they are in context where other people are very important to them, that they are much better able to tell you what it feels like to be in their place if they're provided with guidance and support, scaffolding, whatever term you want to use. They're, and I'll give you a couple of really nice examples of that in a minute. The social context of, of, for research, therefore, is critical. The relationships and interactions between children and other people are a key. So even at the earliest stages of research, when you're asking for informed consent, there has to be very sensitive communication, um, not only telling but listening, um, ability to read body language and feelings, uh, and warm relationships and a balance of power although that's very hard to achieve. And uh, positioning the child as an expert seems to work very well in doing this. And um, <coughs> I've got a quote here from a study by Boylan and Ng, where the, and they were talking to children in state care. And these are the sort of things children say. I'm sure many of you who are researchers here will have experienced this. I enjoyed it. There should be more opportunities for us to have to say, to say what we think to people that will listen to what we have to say. So actually, most children are pleased to be listened to, even if they're vulnerable and people are fearful that talking about things might hurt them more. But there's a, a, I found a really nice study by Anne Solberg, and she was working with children who'd been uh, subject to domestic violence. And she was a good example of positioning herself as uh, position, posi positioning herself as ignorant and wanting the children to show <coughs> show her what they knew. So she engaged actively with the children. She joined in the production of the story. It's a bit. It, it's a good example of scaffolding. She asked for clarification and what was going to happen next. And the children would correct her if she was wrong. They'd ignore her or they would elaborate on what she, she was saying. And she interviewed a nine-year-old boy, Matthias, who was staying in a shelter with his mother because uh, the mother's partner had become violent towards Matthias. Solberg gradually edged closer to the most sensitive aspect of the topic. When Matthias told her he'd been almost strangled by his mother's boyfriend because he he didn't like him doing his homework. 
his mother had said and done nothing, she asked, how is that for you? Matthias replied, disgusting. Uh, again, I think a nice example of a, a sensitive guidance which actually helps children to talk about their experience. She argues you should keep an open mind about whether children want to participate, not, or, participate or not and back off when they don't want to engage. The ethics of respect. I'm not going to talk a lot about ethics, but just a little bit here. So, um, as the principal stakeholders in their own well-being, then children deserve respect and dignity. Uh, really no different to, at all to adults. So, um, people who give up their time to research should, should, should be able to be expect to be treated with the highest standards of consideration and respect. So Gary Nelton talks about the medium is the message. And uh, the sort of things I've been talking about, the way that people engage with children, regardless of the particular things that are going to happen to children in the process of research, nothing will be accomplished without proper respect. So as I say, no different from being treated like people. I think that's meant to be the British Psychological Association, BPA. And uh, so things like understanding children's culture is hugely important. In New Zealand, thank you, um, that's uh, an issue for Pākehā researchers working with either Pacific or Māori children. Uh, one anthropologist, Joan Mitch, reports the story about how a teacher working with a, a group of Māori children kept repeating herself to the children. And she, because they were raising their eyebrows, she thought this meant they didn't understand. But in actual fact, it meant that they did understand and uh, it, it, it was a different kind of body language from what the Pākehā teacher had expected to. And so she says, Kinloch says that Māori, and this is of course generalised, but uh, I think it's important to be sensitive to these things, tend to, tend to look on Pākehā as being overly talkative and uh, unresponsive to what other people are trying to tell them. Whereas she, th she says that Pākehā often construct Māori as, uh, uh, sorry, I got it the wrong way around. Pākehā people, uh, Māori Pacifica tend to construct Pākehā as unresponsive and hard to talk to, while Māori and Samoan are forever talking and un uh, uh, construct Pākehā as is forever talking and unresponsive to what people are trying to tell them. Sorry about that. So what works to help children tell? I think I just want to talk a little bit about a study that we did which looked at different methods of talking to children. In a, this is for our book, Learning in the Making. And we actually wrote an article telling of some of the failures, and I'm going to tell you about one of them now. So we tried different kinds of groupings to get, see whether that would help children talk. So one was a focus group led by a researcher, one led by a teacher who knew the children better, of course, uh, although we knew them very well because it was a longitudinal study and we'd been around the children for a long time and had visited their homes and so on. Interviewing the child not just one-to-one -one, but with a friend, um, uh, interviewing the child with a mother, and one-to-one -one interview with the child. And I just wanted to show you what can go wrong by reading you what happened in the first example. Eight children were kneeling around a round table in the middle of the enclosed room where Judith, this is my colleague Judith Duncan, had placed her laptop and a microphone to record the children's discussion. On the laptop, key photos were selected for the children to comment on. Within moments of the children arriving, there was pandemonium. Depending on the angle of the laptop computer, the screen became difficult to see for several of the children. Two of the oldest children attempted to take charge of the equipment, grabbing at the screen and pulling at the microphone. After several minutes of attempting to engage in dialogue with the group, it became obvious that this was not going to capture anything other than directions for children not to touch the screen or not to touch the microphone and so sit, to sit back and to not hurt so-and-so. Judith called the session to a halt after 10 minutes and found that, in fact, the tape had not recorded. 
On closer examination, the cord had been pulled out of the microphone in some of the earliest jostlings, and so the little that had been said had not been recorded. Overall, the experience was chaotic, and not only did it fail to capture the children's voices, it placed Judith in a crowd management role. So I just wanted to give you an example, and I think it's helpful if we report on some of these things that don't work. And in fact, most of the other methods, apart from the first one, did work, and a lot of productive conversations emerged from children's experience, and the use of the stimulated recall with the photographs. So, um, one thing that is often forgotten in doing research that's related to children's well-being is actually letting children know what happened from the research. And uh, there's a very clear uh, article in the UN Convention that says children have the right to receive information and ideas in writing and in print in the form of art or through any other media of the child's choice. Often very taxing for the researcher's ingenuity. Um, but I think now with things like YouTube and other visual methods, it shouldn't be that hard to be able to tell children about the findings of our research. They have a right to hear about the research findings. Um, I, I think that uh, it's worth reflecting on the fact that the kind of publications that we as academics get rewarded for reach a very restricted audience. And, Really, unless we take it further ourselves, it's not going to have much effect. And I have to say, myself, in my career, I've made several films. And I think those films had more impact than a word that I ever wrote. In fact, I'm thinking that my next project might be a film. But um, it, it is very, very different <coughs> if you can present something visually. And it, it's very useful for some audiences. So the feedback is usually directed at adults, but not children. Um, now, this is a, um, a, a paper I, I went to in Edinburgh last week, really intrigued me, talking about an ethical di dilemma. I'm sorry, this isn't in my written paper, Jenny, because I, it was new, I added it. And uh, what uh, Sarah... Sarah Nelson was talking about was the problem with large-scale research on children which gives them confidentiality but where the findings indicate that the children are very much at risk and she was talking about a particular study a major ESRC project on youth crime antisocial behavior substance abuse and truancy and involved yearly surveys so there were large numbers, I don't know the actual sample size, but in the thousands of children who were answering these questions. And what this, the research revealed was that many of these children were really at risk. They were either, they were being bullied, they were being sexually <coughs> abused, they were involved in drugs, and the, the pr school principals had given permission for this research to be carried out, but nobody did anything. Uh, up to me, of course, this would be a failure of the ethics committee. I don't think such a study would get through our ethics committee. I don't know how it is for other researchers, but this was evidently a very reputable funding body that had funded these projects. And at the very least, she said, in these cases, Children should be given an information sheet about where they can get help with these things. Many times they wouldn't have reported on these things, though, if they hadn't been given confidentiality. So it is an ethical dilemma. And she calls her paper, See No Evil, Hear No Evil. So um, I've talked a lot in my lectures about the university, the, the micro-orientation towards research, the... Um, which is really, I suppose, in response to the critique of, of psychology and the, uh, of universalizing discourses about children, the universalized child, if you like. And um, Woodner, Woodhead and Faulkner call this the spurious veneer of co coherence on diverse childhoods. And 
So I have been involved in the later part of my career anyway a lot with a lot of work of qualitative studies um, which have attempted to look at the diversity of children's experiences and trying to resist the temptation to overgeneralize findings. Now the problem with that is that almost everyone, and I have to stop my students doing this all the time, who's working in the qualitative area, does want to generalize. And so it's very difficult not to. I just have one really good example, I think, and I, forgive me, I, I don't think I talked about it in any of these lectures, but there's a nice example in New Zealand, which I believe is really opposite to what is about to happen here from listening to Jane Fulton's paper at the King's College um, seminar last week, where um, the work that we did at the Children's Issues Centre looking at children who are separate from separated and divorced families pointed that to the very diverse ways that children responded to that situation. Even children within one family want a different kind of contact and residence arrangements. And so um, we were very opposed to a presumption in favour of contact, which is quite common in, in the law. That is the idea that normally you, uh, children must be in contact with their non-resident parents. Our research showed that actually most children did want contact, but a small and significant group of children didn't. What was interesting was, this, and this is a, a nice example of working with the Law Commission and the Family Court, that the legislation that was drafted recognised that, that you couldn't generalise to all children. It said that a child must be given opportunities to, well, okay, so the first thing in the new Act in 2004 was that children, children's views had to be ascertained. And not only did they have to be ascertained, they had to be taken account of. But read the third bullet there. The particular, the welfare and best interests of the particular child in his or her particular circumstances must be considered. So um, as I understand from what Jane Fortin was saying, that a new bill, uh, it, which is being discussed right now, <laughs> that, that uh, there is going to be a presumption of contact. And that means that judges will routinely uh, assume that children should have contact, rather than making sure that you ascertain whether it's appropriate in that particular circumstance. I may not have got that quite right. But. Um, and regardless of the child age, child's age, that's another really interesting thing, because some Sometimes children's views do have to be ascertained, but specifically here it, it says, regardless of the child's age. And that was again to try and overwrite that assumption that younger children were incompetent, to tell you. All right, so um, to, to, to move on from that problem that if we do qualitative research, we can't really generalise. And um, there, Ha, of course, the, the person who's done the most work in this is um, Jens Kvortrup. And he has actually argued that we're doing too much micro-oriented work in childhood studies. And he argues no one method alone can produce all the knowledge needed, and I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, and here's a quote from him. <coughs> sometimes suggested by researchers that it is dangerous to generalise because we lose information. That is indeed true, he says, but I would suggest losing information in a controlled way is the very idea of research. It was never the task of researchers to tell everything they knew. On the contrary, the task was always to sort out the most important features and findings. And, of course, um, there are many issues that need to be uh, looked at from a macro orientation with larger samples and controlled conditions. Um, Kvortrup says we can't map out children's life worlds unless we have a macro orientation. And Priscilla Alderson in her new book lists some of the societal structures that clearly we will need macro research, and she doesn't say this, but I'm assuming it, to study. That is, 
the features of childhood that include villages, towns and cities, transport and communication networks, markets and states, social and political systems, cultural structures of language, education, the arts and religion, collective memory and myth, physical bodies and the natural world, all of those uh, structural conditions. So um, I come to this perhaps wishy-washy, eclectic view that we do need to be doing all kinds of research. And here, parent, uh, uh, one of the things that used to be very true is that you were either on the side of a quantitative approach and uh, the use of randomized control trials, just one example of that. Um, Helen Roberts has said, said these paradigm wars are phony. She says it's not right to, to dismiss randomized control trials as technocratic. Um, and structural issues do require large-scale research. For example, I'll give you two examples there. How is children's <laughs> health affected by fiscal restraint? How is children's learning influenced by adverse adult-child ratios? We have to have those big-scale studies. Um, I do believe that randomized control trials, where would we have got in early childhood education? In New Zealand without the Perry Preschool Project. In fact, our um, Ministry of Education is now saying, wouldn't it be good if you had your own Perry Preschool Project? I guess in England you have the EPI Project, which is um, not a randomized control trial, but it is a very large scale quantitative study. But sometimes they can be narrow and decontextualized, and so we have to be aware of the different advantages and disadvantages, and they're not really well placed to look at contextual issues. And here I quote my colleague Martin, Martin Woodhead again, and he says it's unwise to throw out the baby, that is the baby being child development, with the bath water. Uh, and, uh, he says, one of the things he says is that child, childhood studies would be very marginalised if it did. But then I think that we do have to look critically at child, at child development. And even Alison James, who was one of the first who told, told us to look at constructions of childhood and children's agency, uh, whoops, says, one way forward towards sustaining childhood research would be to set the by now commonplace qualitative studies of children's own perspectives, voices and agency alongside other work that explores the structural conditions that shape childhood as a generational space. Such an integration would help ensure that we do not lose sight of the different impacts that societal forces such as the market, neoliberalism, the state, urbanization and so on have on childhood as a generational unit. I have to say neoliberalism, it seems to be a global force and I can, just talking to so many people in the UK, I see the same kinds of movements um, influenced by it. And here I again quote Priscilla Alderson where she says Yes, you should, we should look at structures and we should, but in looking at structure, let's not forget about individual children's experiences. We've got to hang on to that. And it's a nice quote from her, I think, the power and meaning of parameters around childhood similarly in here, not only in external structures, but also in how they impinge on children and are variously experienced and sustained resisted or reconstructed by children. So that in my example of you know the effect of ratio on children, children experience that environment as uncaring when there isn't an adult to be able to interact with and relate to. So finally, how am I doing for time, John? Yeah. Five minutes? Yeah, I'm just about <coughs> there. I wanted to talk briefly about optimizing the uptake of research. And uh, here I draw a little bit on the work of Robert Cheskin in the States, who says that too often we've worked from a unidirectional model, where we've moved from basic research to innovation development to dissemination, and then discuss uh, 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 how, the, how the research then can be disseminated. 
and engaged uh, other policymakers and so on. And he, um, he criticizes that and we, says we should be moving back and forwards between <coughs> these different models. One important factor is that consumers of research be able to set the agenda as well as respond. I have to say, and I had an interesting example, at the Edinburgh conference I heard Barry Percy Smith talking about a study he had done with local authorities, um, which came up with some findings that so displeased the users that they refused to publish them. And that is perhaps not uncommon, um, where, uh, you know, with the people who are asking you to ask certain questions don't really like the answers that you come up with. I guess I'm speaking from as a researcher here, but um, and that in fact the consumers <laughs> of research might see it differently. So I, I believe that the input of policymakers and practitioners is, is important from the beginning, and that you can actually, uh, because of their understanding of the situation on the ground, that you can actually <coughs> get better research. Um, I know the work that we did on. Punishment, there was a literature review, sitting around with all the officials from all the government agencies and government departments really helped to focus on what sort of research we, should we be looking for. For instance, they weren't just interested in where, what the effects of physical punishment were, they wanted to know what the effects of other kinds of discipline were. And that relationship has to be negotiated over time and it requires mutual respect and understanding. It requires some research knowledge too, I think, from the part of the practitioners and from the policy makers. So I think it's very important that we go on training our professionals so that they can understand and interpret research and not misuse it. And uh, I think that's one of the things that gets lost when we cut short training. And I, I don't know, I believe that here your teacher education is going to be more based in schools and I don't see how you can get that kind of knowledge entirely from an apprenticeship model in any profession. Um, uh, tailoring and disseminating to different audiences, uh, I've talked a little bit about that before and uh, I just think the possibilities are amazing now for different ways to um, implement research. So this is really elaborating pretty much on what I've said before, that there need to be smooth pathways, and there have to be collaboration and communication. There has to be a common language, and that can be very difficult when you're working in interdisciplinary, and uh, we have different criteria for what is good research in different disciplines and different approaches. And I like that quote, that research should move comfortably between basic information to application and back again with great fluidity. fluidity. So um, some of the things that help uptake, I think, is the knowledgeability and research savviness of either the public servants who are in the policy making roles or the professionals. And I mentioned teachers, but the same for social workers, lawyers, and so on. <coughs> I think that coming from a small country, it's easier. I mean, people do ring us up from ministries. I got rang up by the Treasury because the Minister of, um, the Minister of Finance had, had had doubts about what, what this early childhood research, the value of it. Was it really a sound research? And so I had to swat up on all the... Um, long-term studies about the importance of early experience so that I could argue or I could say to the Treasury officials that I thought it was good <coughs> research. Um, but that pro perhaps does happen to some extent, I'm sure, in fields like Graham's, uh, who is an engineer, but whether it happens uh, in the childhood area, I'm not sure. So educated practitioners is absolutely key. And NGOs too, and I'm sorry, here I've been talking from point of view of an academic researcher, but looking at the work that the Young Lives Project does, often there is an international donor that is um, the user of the research. And that's a different situation again. Uh, and the 
finally the political will nothing will happen I mean even though I talked to Treasury and said it was good research they aren't going to invest any more in early childhood education right now the barriers are the very limited and contested nature of research funding um, the fact that applied research outputs might not be as valued as much I think we've moved a bit on that one and uh, political agendas and lack of political will and also the fact that Funding for disseminating research is often not there. So, to finish, I guess what I am arguing is that there is value in a children's rights and childhood studies impetus for research. I, I know that it has been a big influence on my own career, and I'm sure that of many others here. But how we construct children and childhood shapes, what we research, why we research, and how we use research. We're moving away from research on children to research with children. We have to have diverse research methods and we have to understand each other's diverse approaches. Um, we hear evidence space that, you know, that we want, that politicians want an evidence space all the time. But what do they interpret as evidence-based? In one of my other lectures, I pointed out that in the child protection work, it looks as if it's going to mean an excuse to take money away from a lot of community projects because there is no evidence base. And I think that is very unethical. And uh, you need collaborations and political will if you're going to change things. Thank you. Going to, I noticed Dan wasn't using the mic, so I'll try without as well. If anybody at the back can't hear me, then please wave. Um, did you hear that, by the way? Yeah, yes. okay. Um, I've followed and admired Anne's work for many years, and so it's a huge honour for me to be asked to respond to her, the final lecture in this series. Um, I agree with virtually everything she said, so this isn't going to be a critique. It will be a few thoughts, a few reflections, and I'll try to be pretty brief because I think it's important that everybody has a chance to, to respond and, and comment rather than just people at the top table. Um, Anne's lecture has ranged uh, very widely and wisely over a wide area. Um, it seems to me that it's fundamentally about four questions, although not necessarily in this order. What kind of research? For what purpose? Who and how? And how can we ensure that it's used well? And some of the key points I picked up um, from the lecture were the moral imperative underlying research with children and into childhood. Um, the key relationship between childhood studies and children's rights. Um, the importance of respect for children as research participants, respect for their expertise, and also sensitivity in the way they're approached and in the way that researchers communicate with them. Um, some of the barriers to children's participation in research the futility of paradigm wars and the importance of the macro as well as the micro perspective and the need for multiple strategies for influencing policy and practice. So the few things that I'd like to say about all that are first of all yes I, I agree very strongly that there is an, an ethical foundation to childhood research and childhood studies isn't unique in that respect. Um, there are many areas of social science where one can see very obviously how research is driven by researchers wanting to change things, to influence society. Um, and more broadly, that um, 
the idea of a value-free social science is, is, I think, generally understood to be something of a myth. Um, James and Prout put it in terms of the double hermeneutic. Um, in other words, the idea that researchers are embedded in the society with which they are studying, um, that unlike molecules or photons, the objects of our research can access our research either directly or be influenced by it indirectly. Um, so social science tends to be engaged and childhood studies is a particularly good example of that. It seems to me that the relationship between childhood studies and children's rights is both a contingent one in that they've developed side by side historically and have supported and strengthened each other but is also a, a deeper connection through the commitment on the one side to viewing children as social actors in the present, and on the other, a view of children as citizens, which is not always articulated, but I think is implicit in the CRC rights to freedom of speech, thought and association, and to have one's views taken into account. The idea of respect for children as research participants follows from viewing them as social actors and as citizens. Unfortunately, those views are not universally shared or understood, which is where some of the problems arise. And I think there's a serious problem about research ethics as it's currently understood and practiced. This doesn't uniquely affect children, but it does affect them particularly. The problem, in my view, stems from one, the misapplication of concerns about clinical research to research that is mainly about having conversations with people, to the mistaken assumption that ethical research practice is best ensured by a committee scrutinizing each research proposal in advance in a rather formulaic way, and three, the uncritical and unhelpful use of categories like vulnerable I'm still waiting to meet someone who isn't vulnerable. And I do think if there are some people who are more vulnerable than others, there may be more reasons for doing research with them as well. Um, I did have a research student uh, a couple of years ago submit an application which got the response from the Chair of Ethics Committee. And this was for a study of young black people in an inner city area with mental health issues or who have been identified as having emotional and behavioural disorders or ADHD or whatever. And the response was, this all looks fine, but how will he ensure that no vulnerable people take part? <laughs> um, it took a while to construct a polite and respectful answer to that, but we managed it. That's only one barrier to children's participation in research along with the others created by universities, by funders, by agencies, by the wider culture, and by children's disadvantaged social position in terms of things like freedom of choice, mobility, access to resources. In that context, the work that researchers like Anne have been able to do is truly impressive, both in giving children a voice as research participants and in enabling them to take leading or directional roles in a variety of projects. One question that interests me is, what kinds of research can be done by involving children in these very direct ways? Anne makes a good case for using a wide range of research methods, and in particular points to the importance of the macro perspective. For example, as Jens Kvortrup has long advocated, conducting deep analysis of children's structural position within and across different societies. Much of the work done in childhood studies is ethnographic or is based on giving children a voice. We all know that voice is not the whole story, that what people say is not necessarily what they think or is at least dependent on the context in which they speak, and that what people think is not necessarily a good predictor of how they will behave. We also know that each of us has a limited and variable understanding of our own structural position, whether we are adults or children, 
whether we're professional researchers or lay people, and those categories are not coterminous. So there's an interesting question about how far we can take children with us in these different research journeys, and what kind of roles as participant, advisor, data producer, analyst or interpreter they can be expected to occupy, particularly when we're looking at those profound structural questions. So there's a challenge here to test children's capacity to be involved and adults' ability to involve them across a wider range of different settings and tasks. Some of Mary Kellett's work demonstrates that children can do more on their own initiative than simply conduct small surveys, participant observation, for example. The young people who worked with us on the evaluation of the Children's Commissioner for Wales were involved in all aspects of a multi-method project, using, including critical data analysis. No doubt there are limits to what children can do in the field of research, but I don't think we've reached them yet. And then finally, there's the question about how we can ensure that research is used to good effect and has a beneficial influence on policy and practice. And here I also agree with pretty well everything that Anna said. There are problems about the undervaluing of certain kinds of research by certain kinds of decision makers. And actually, my experience is that consumers do very often set the agenda, and that's fine. Uh, but I don't want them setting the findings. Um, I had a research student working in Cambodia a few years ago, Glenn Miles, who had to do two kinds of research at the same time. The qualitative work he really wanted to do, and the research producing a lot of numbers that officials might be willing to take some notice of. And I'm always reminded of General Dreidel's comment, for those who've read Catch-22, hey, do we have any figures on how scared they are? <laughs> Another former research student, uh, Vicky Johnson, working in England, found that it was really hard to get some decision makers to take research findings seriously because A, they were produced by children and young people, and B, they used visual and interactive methods. However, with persistence and a lot of dialogue, some of these positions did shift over time. As Anne says, producing research findings for children is one of our responsibilities as researchers. And the, some, some experience suggests that if you do that, the results may actually be more likely to be read by some of those key decision makers as well. Not because they necessarily have a reading age of 12, but because they, they like something that's easy to read, accessible, well presented. Um, but in the end, it's all about taking children seriously, to steal the title of another book from Down Under, um, Jan Mason and Toby Fattori, um, and persuading others to take them seriously too, back to the double hermeneutic effect, in fact, and back to the recognition of children as citizens, as people who have needs and rights and a contribution to make. And, and that's what I take from what Anne's given us today and in this series. Uh, but I'll be interested to hear what other people have to say too. Ten minutes for questions, and I will try to facilitate that. So, please, could we have some questions of Anne and Nigel? Yeah, person there. There's a roving mic. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very interested in the notion of evolving um, capacities, and I wonder um, if we see children as um, competent social actors, if we perhaps ought to re be revisiting um, the United Nations Convention and actually addressing this notion of evolving capacities. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, 
I'll explain it a little bit more, maybe. <laughs> uh, are you suggesting that we shouldn't uh, recognize, use, or involve younger children who don't have the capacity? No, no, quite the reverse. I, I don't quite understand. Quite the reverse, actually, Anne. Um, I think as adults, sometimes we're not very good at recognizing children's abilities, yeah. children's yeah. capabilities. Yeah, yeah. And actually, that's our limitation, not the children's yeah. limitation. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, you know, I worked teaching child development for many years. Almost anything that anyone has ever said about what children can and can't do at particular ages have been proved to be an underestimate of their capacity. Mm. So um, it's partly that issue of constructions. How do we construct children? Do we expect them to be able to, to do certain things? Or, um, and, and also, uh, it, it, it's partly, I think I've lost my thread here. Um, yeah, yeah, there is evolving capacity, but also, yeah, the other point I was going to make was that it is partly the context in which we um, if, in which we try and listen to them and gain their perspectives. Uh, it's that example from that Solberg study was one where, you know, something which was very difficult to talk about, she was able to get the child to talk about. And so in a very supportive and sensitive context, then children can make their views known. So do you think we ought to be revisiting the convention, perhaps? But I don't, oh, you mean the bit about, oh, uh, mm, in Asian maturity in there? Mm. Yeah, that Gerritin Lansdowne has yeah, interrogated. I think we can just interpret it the way we want to. I don't think it's going to get changed, does it? Is, does anyone know, is there a general comment about Asian maturity in the convention? I don't think so, but that... There's a general comment in Article 12. Yes, but so does it say anything about more about age and maturity? Anyway, uh, there is something on early childhood, Anne. There is something I mean, on early childhood. childhood. Yeah. Yes, I know that, but I don't. I think it does say that young children are very capable of expressing a view. It does. It definitely does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Could, can I just ask you to sorry say who you are when you ask a question? Oh, sorry. Um, Jane Murray. And where you're from? Oh, sorry, <laughs> University of Northampton. <laughs> yeah, could I just add to that? The, the general comment also um, supports the idea that Article 12 can be read off as about children's collective rights to mm. a voice and to be heard, not just their individual mm. rights. Although it's very clear, if you listen to the people who are involved in drafting the convention, that that wasn't the intention to start with. But that's shifted mm. because of the work mm. of the committee, mm. although the wording of the article hasn't changed, a new interpretation has been established. I think that the um, UN Committee on the Rights of, Ch of the Child, uh, others may know more about this than me, but it, it really reads like childhood studies language all the way mm. through it. And so there have been some important childhood studies scholars that have had an input into those general comments. Uh, uh, that have helped to recognise the capacity of younger children, for instance. Next question. Um, it's Kate, Kate Molly from Action for Children. Um, just thinking about child-led research, quite an open question. When children are initiators of research, what are your feelings about the types of projects they're particularly interested in initiating? Oh gosh, I think we should pass that one on to the other two. I mean, there are just lots of really good examples, but they, none of them spring to my mind immediately. And what, I was just reading something of that the other day. I, I mean, things that affect them in their mm. own lives, obviously. What's happening at school, um, what their friends are, are saying and doing. <laughs> the things that, that impinge on, on them. I mean, for instance, children who are from divorced and separated families, that's on their minds. Just anything. Mm. Yeah, Do you have I, any other, I don't think well, there's any general I'm, thing. I'm so. racking my brain for examples. It's, 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 it's well, very hard to generalise. I mean, most commonly 
children seem to want to research things that are directly related to their own experience and very often in the context in which the opportunity comes up so if you're working with children in schools on research projects they very often come up with research questions that are about what happens in school but then you'll get totally surprised by somebody coming up with something that's simply something that the child is intellectually curious about mm. that isn't related to their own life at all but they want to research it so, so I mean, the, the are examples that are coming into my mind are Mary Kellett with her uh, Children's Research Centre um, worked with, I think they were 10-year-olds, mm -hmm. and, and the children, I mean, there are certain critiques that one can make of, of, of what she did, but the children came up with surprising questions that mm -hmm. they wanted to research, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure, somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but for example, one of them was like, what it's like being small for your age in the playground. Mm. Very important from mm. a 10 year old's mm. point of view. Mm. Another one, as far as I remember, was about what it's like when both your parents are out at work a lot. That's mm. what children wanted mm. to find out about mm. and the effects were on them. So, I mean, it, 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 it could be surprising, but it can also be very valuable in terms of, of shifting the perspective. It's what we construct as children's problems and not mm -hmm. and, and what children may see as something that's of interest to find out about. I think it's a good question and making me think because I think children are also really concerned about issues like the environment, you know, climate change. There's some wonderful examples in um, Nigel's and Barry Percy Smith's book on young people's participation. One of the ones that comes to mind are children in India who um, wanted to change the hygiene practices in the villages and taught the village, collected information about how, how you know, where the latrines were and uh, what people thought about it. And they were so close to the ground in the villages that they had access to information that the adults in the NGO agencies didn't have. And they really brought about significant social change, more or less on their own, supported by adults. Mm. It's, I mean, the, the study I'm involved in, Young Lives, we are, we would in no way claim to be a participate, take a participatory approach in research, which would involve the children defining what's important to them. But we do have some examples where we've done things like um, use drama and story completion exercises, and we've provided them with the kind of initial stories that we want to hear them discuss. And then they've taken control of the research and said, no, actually, can we stop doing that now? Can we create our own stories that are what really matters to us uh, as very important uh, questions? And from some of those stories that they've come back, I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of, uh, again, it's an, an example. It was India that this happened, where in an odd way, perhaps the research is more tightly controlled, but they took control of the process and came up with certainly two topics that, w that had not been expected and they are child protection concerns. One was the extent of domestic violence that they witnessed because there's a huge problem of, again, we, didn't, we weren't asking questions about this, but of alcohol consumption um, amongst men who have sometimes are indeed paid in partly in alcohol um, as well as money. Um, so there's a problem of domestic violence and then the other thing that they wanted to, to problematise in drama was early marriage. Uh, but because of their, okay, so we could say, we could either say that's not really what we're interested in because we're really interested in, you know, these broad questions to do with growing up in poverty. But what we've been able to do is say, oh, yes, that's really interesting. Look at what we've got in our data about these questions to do with domestic violence and indeed other forms of violence that children experience. Um, and sort of pick up a line from the children and follow it through as something that really matters to them. And actually, it then turns out to have an important policy hook, policy, policy relevance right now at this very moment in time when there's a big discussion going on about child protection. So, you know, thank you to the children. It wasn't in our initial research brief. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, but now, now it is very much so. So it can be a little bit arbitrary, but that's I think that's where one can take the lead very much from children about matters to them. It might be difficult for funders to, to say, well, yeah, okay, we'll fund a study into anything you want. That's the problem, really. And the policymakers not necessarily being willing to sort of embrace that wide approach. So. Yeah, sorry, I shouldn't be. Uh, I shouldn't be talking. Okay. Any more questions, please? Yeah, there's one here. Thanks. 
Hi, my name's uh, Rebecca Evans. I'm from various places. I'm a social worker and a local authority. I'm from New Zealand and I'm also studying at Kingston University. And I'm just wondering, sort of general question for anyone, around um, the involvement of the Youth Parliament in the UK. There's a Youth Parliament here. Each council has a, a Youth Council. Whether they're involved in research at all. Would anybody from the audience like to answer that question? Uh, in New Zealand we have a youth parliament too. I don't think it's been active in the last few years, but we were actually involved in some research evaluating that. And uh, I can't say it wasn't actually research initiated by the young people, but they certainly had some very interesting things to say, which made us think quite critically about that whole process. But. I won't go into more depth there, except to say that, you know, it was a very select group of children for one thing, and uh, the way they were selected was a, a very interesting. Sometimes the the uh, members of parliament, what what happens is the members of parliament get a, a young person to substitute for them, and they spend a couple of days in parliament mm. debating things um, that often the the uh, might have been, you know, a friend's child or something like that or somebody w that was in the local political party mm. young persons group they didn't actually represent children particularly that was one of the issues I, I recall and also it was very interesting if they got support from the um, their local from the MP whether you know, showed them r the ropes, made them feel uh, comfortable in that situation. But I think we felt it was a positive thing in the end, but it's a bit of a tokenistic thing as well. Um, I, I say have a look at Liverpool, it's quite interesting, mm, mm. Um, because there's been a children's parliament there, and, mm. and people can nod or shake their heads. I would say that it tends to come and go within local authorities, it very much depends on the will at the time. Yeah. I'm not sure about the UK Youth Parliament. I know that Funky Dragon, the Young People's yeah. Assembly for Wales, has done some major research, okay. pieces of research. They did a couple for the last reporting round for the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And I think the Scottish Youth Parliament has done something similar as well. Okay, I think I'm going to call a stop to it now. Oh, well, there's another person. Oh, sorry. Okay, one last question, please. Oh, sorry. I Pops thought here. I saw someone put their hand up. I was wrong. In the scratching area. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> Mythical question, so let's move on no, to where we were meant to be, which is to. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Thanks to Anne. And Thank you very much. I'll be, I'll be brief. I'm Philip Murphy, I'm director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and Deputy Dean at the School of Advanced Study here. I just want to say what, what a huge pleasure and, and, and honour it's been to be able to host the final lecture in what has clearly been a, a, a hugely successful series uh, by Anne. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the school, we're an, an incredibly vibrant research hub bringing together 10 different institutes spread across a range of disciplines from history, classics, music, law. Um, we uh, have a, a very impressive program of events which is up on the net, please do uh, keep an eye on it. Um, we are uh, not in any sense a, an ivory tower, we, 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 we value our role as a bridge between academics and policy makers, even when, as someone said earlier on, the policy makers don't particularly like our, our answers. And um, we are indeed, as Virginia uh, mentioned, uh, a huge film set. Um, the, next time, the next time you're watching the latest Batman movie, and I'm sure you're all huge fans, look out for the, the distinctive hemispherical lamps in the ballroom scene. Um, uh, we benefit tremendously from our partners outside the University of London. And we've had a particularly uh, uh, enriching relationship 
over recent years with the New Zealand UK Link Foundation. And I'd like to thank all the people involved uh, in, in the foundation. It's been a great pleasure working with uh, them all, uh, with Graeme Davis and his, his colleagues, and, and particularly, and, and Anne mentioned her early on, Lisa Fletcher, who's put a huge amount of effort into organizing <coughs> these, these, these four uh, seminars. Um, we've been delighted to be able to host three visiting New Zealand professors so far, uh, beginning with Margaret Wilson, former speaker of uh, the New Zealand Assembly, uh, uh, followed by Jonathan Gardner of Victoria University, and we're very much looking forward uh, later this year to uh, hosting Professor Arthur Grimes of the University of, of Auckland. Um, but let me end by, by thanking our panellists, uh, Graham Davis, Virginia Morrow, Nigel Thomas, but of course, above all, uh, Professor Anne Smith. Uh, it's, been, it's been a pleasure having her here uh, over the last couple of months. Um, and listening to her talk, I think we've all realised we've been listening to a, 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 an absolute expert in her field who's managed to distill into this talk really a, a lifetime of wisdom and experience working in, in this field. It's been a great pleasure to, to listen to her. Um, one of uh, our guiding principles here is that um, among the best environments in which to exchange scholarly and challenging ideas is over a glass of wine. Uh, and, and if it's New Zealand wine, all the better. Uh, the, the reception will be is set out at the back, so please join us for uh, a glass of wine. But before we, before we leave, let's, let's again thank Anne for a magnificent lecture.